بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبع هداهم إلى يوم الدين All praise due to Allah and my peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The chapter is باب هجرة الرجل That is chapter 198 and the hadith is 397 Now, page 76, chapter 188, cutting oneself off from people. Hadith 397. Auf bin al Harith bin at Tufail, the son of Aisha radiallahu anha's brother by her mother, said, Aisha radiallahu anha was informed that Abdullah ibn Zubair, the nephew of Aisha radiallahu anha, um, her sister Asma's son, on whose name she based her kunya as Umm Abdullah, said about something which Aisha radiallahu was selling or giving away as a gift. By Allah, if she does not stop, I will prevent her from disposing of her property. Can I just ask who said that? Who said that? According to what you have recorded. Uh, no, it's not. Supposed to be Abdullah bin Zubair, isn't it? Did you understand what you said? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Go ahead. Say it on the beginning. Auf bin al Harith bin yeah, can you say that, please? Uh, no. Auf bin al Harith no. bin <coughs> at Tufail, the son of Aisha radiallahu anha's brother by her mother, said, Aisha radiallahu anha was informed that Abdullah bin Zubair. So Abdullah bin Zubair, go ahead. Now. He said, <clears throat> said about something which Aisha radiallahu was selling or giving away as a gift. Good. By Allah, if she does not stop, I will prevent her from disposing of her property. Good. She asked, did he say this? She was told yes. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I make a vow to Allah that I will never speak a single word to Ibn Zubayr. Ibn Zubayr sought intercession through the Muhajirin, <coughs> through the Muhajirin, the migrants, with her when she had kept apart from him for a long time. She said, By Allah, I will not let anyone ever intercede for him and I will never break the vow that I have made. Okay, so the long time, let me just break it up a bit better. <laughs> okay, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa ala min tabi'ah hudahum ila yawmideen. This is a, a great uh, story that took place between Abdullah ibn Zubayr who is the nephew of Aisha عنها, and Abdullah ibn Zubayr is a companion his father is a companion his mother is a companion his mother is Asma, the sister of Aisha Abdullah ibn Zubayr he is the first he is the first person to was born in Islam, that means the companion who was born in Islam, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he did not uh, worship anything, father was mother, they were Muslims when he was born, so he was a Muslim from nature and also he kept to be as a Muslim. And Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he was the most beloved person to Aisha radiallahu anha after the Prophet and her father. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu arda, he was so loved by Aisha, his maternal aunt, that she loves him third, third in best, after the Prophet Sallam and after her father Abu Bakr. And he was, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, so righteous to his maternal aunt, very righteous. And also she was righteous to him, because she will never, radiallahu uh, anha uh, wardaha, that she will never have anything that is sadaqa that she will give him some. Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu wardah, Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu wardah, he was so close to his mother and his maternal aunt. And there was a hadith that we discussed before when he said, radiallahu anhu, I've never seen more of a righteous or more of a generous person than Aisha and Asma. He said like this, Asma and his mother. I've never seen more generous than Aisha and Asma. And he said, verily, Aisha radiallahu anha, 
she used to gather the things together until she gets something and then she will give it in sadaqah. Whereas Asma, whatever she gets, she will give it as a sadaqah. So this is by the way, been mentioned in the hadith, which we've mentioned, I can't remember the number now, but inshallah I will uh, bring it out. If somebody has got the number, please. So I remember that they, we have discussed this hadith, that is Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha, is to be the most generous and asma. I'll leave it inshallah, and at the end of the class we'll look at it. Um, here Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to give sadaqah, and she had now at the moment, she had sold, and the, the, the selling here, it was for a house, dark. So Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he thought that she should not sell that house. And basically, when she sells a house, Aisha, she will give it as a charity. He said, verily, either she will stop doing this, or I will restrict her from doing that. Now, restrict her, that means I will put sort of uh, restriction upon her. That this person is not fit to deal with his wealth. That's what it means. So when Aisha was informed about that, she said, did he say this? Now when she said, did he say this? That means she is confirming before she jumps to conclusion. And this is very important that we learn that the person should all the time verify before he jumps to conclusion. Because usually the person he hears something about him or against him, straight away his anger will take over and then the person will jump to conclusion and then he will do things that he will regret later on. So she said, did he say that? Because this is a, you know, a word shouldn't have been said. Yes, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, yes, he was the mayor and the, 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 oath, the, the authority in his hand, but he can't speak to his maternal aunt and the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet and the most beloved wife of the Prophet of Allah in such a way. He could have come to her and told her. But to say that where people conveyed that to her, she was upset. So upset that she had made an oath. It says here a vow, but the vow, Later on, we know said oath. By Allah, I will not talk to a Zubay, the son of Zubay. She said, I talk to the son of the Zubay. He didn't even mention his name. Because the Zubay, he has more than one son. He has Abdullah, and he has Urwa. Urwa was not a companion. He had worn after the Prophet's son's death. So she said, I will not speak to the son of Zubay whatsoever. And she went Abdullah. Now, when this boycotting took a long time, longer than what Abdullah thought. And what did he think? Maybe three days and that's it. But it took longer than that. And he was caring about this because she's his maternal aunt and plus she's the mother of the believer. She doesn't want her to be, she, she doesn't want her to die before, she recon, you know, before he reconciles with her. So here, did we talk about this? Did we, did we speak about it? Did you, so that he sought intercession? Yes? Yes. Okay. So he sought intercession with the Muhajirin. Muhajirin, the migrants. And that is, those are the ones who are senior, senior people, like Abdullah ibn Umar and all of those senior companions. And she said, I will never accept intercession of anybody. And usually, she, the case is with respect, for example, Abdullah ibn Umar and those great companions, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas as well, you know, after the incident of Ali ibn Abi Talib he had something with him, between him and her. But the, she said, I'm not going to accept any intercession and I will not violate my oath. I will stay upon my oath. Now the boycotting stayed for longer. Now we're going to continue, Sean. After that had been going on for a long time, Ibn Zubayr spoke to Al Miswar bin Makhrama. Miswar. Miswar bin, bin Makhrama. Bin Makhrama and uh, Abdurrahman bin Al Aswad bin Abd Yawuf. And they are from the tribe of Zuhra. Who were from Banu Zuhra, the maternal uncles of the Prophet. Yeah. He told them, I ask you by Allah to go to Aisha, radiallahu anha, for it is not lawful for her to vow to cut me off. Al Miswar and Abdurrahman took him along with their cloaks wrapped around him and asked Aisha radiallahu anha's permission to visit her. They spoke the greeting 
Peace be upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and mercy of Allah's blessings. Peace be upon the Prophet. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be. Peace be upon the Prophet and. No, no. Mercy. Peace be upon you. Right. So peace be upon you. So they wrapped <coughs> their cloaks around him and asked Aisha radiallahu permission to visit her. They spoke the greeting, peace be upon you. And the mercy of and Allah. And the mercy of Allah and his blessings. It means assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa no. Can we come in? Aisha radiallahu anha said, come in. They asked all of us, Ummul Mu'mineen. She said, yes, you can all come in. Not knowing that Ibn Zubayr was with them. Okay, stop here. Right, so here when Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he couldn't succeed with his mission, bringing the Muhajirun for the intercession. Now he went to those who are close from the mother side. So he said to Bani Zuhra, and they are very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they are from his like, his very close people. And they are from the maternal sort of uncles of the Prophet of Allah, the tribe of Bani Zuhra. So she, radiallahu anha, she's still insisting not to accept intercession. But here, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he had a plan. He went to them and he beseeched them by Allah. I ask you in the name of Allah to, to help me, just to make me enter on Aisha. For verily, uh, she is not, it's not fit for her. It is not proper. It is not correct for her to boycott me and to make an oath regarding this issue. So he said it's not. So he wants, radiallahu anhu wa not just to reconcile between him and her, but also he wants Aisha, radiallahu anha, to stop it in case that she will be sinning. So she said, it is not halal for her to boycott me or to make an oath to boycott me. Now, we need to understand that Aisha, radiallahu anha, did she boycott him for deen or dunya? And this is going to be a question, inshallah, later on, after we finish the hadith. <clears throat> so, they made a plan. They got him together, and then they put a cloak, and they got a cloak, and they covered him with a cloak, in case Aisha she sees. They went to the house of the Aisha of the Allah, and they said, peace be upon you, and the mercy of Allah and Barakat, which is the full greeting. And this is very good. Every time you want to take permission, to say the salam. Salamu alaykum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And he said, alaykum, upon you, na alaykum. Salamu alaikum. And for a feminine, alaikum. Shall we enter? Now, shall we enter? Anadhul. Nadhul. It, 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 it's a plural as well. Nadhul. Shall we enter? Now, she said, yes. And Aisha, radiallahu anha, she, she, she could tell there are two people. But she can't see the third one. And there's a veil, a hijab, a curtain between. You know, and just the door, there's a curtain as well. So she said, go inside, udkhulu. Go inside as an approval, not udkhul. So they said, all of us, mother of the leaders, so in case you say, I didn't tell you, I just, you know, I didn't say, I, I didn't say all of you, for example, I, I saw one of two of you. So said, all of us, in case she backs off. All of us. Now, if you give her the word, all of us, that's it. Yeah, she said, yes, all of you. Take it out there too. So, she doesn't know that Allah ibn Zubayr is with her, is with her. Now, when they went in, Ibn Zubayr went into the screened off section and embraced Aisha radiallahu anha. And screened began. off section, it means no, he, there's a curtain, he entered the curtain. There's no screened off section. So she opens the door and then behind, behind the door there's a, like a curtain. So there's another sort of gate, basically. And he went inside, inside the curtain. Go ahead. And embraced Aisha radiallahu anha. So he hugged Aisha. And began to plead with her in tears. And now he wants pleading with her in tears. I mean, please stop the boycotting. Please, my aunt. He's my, his aunt. Maternal aunt. He had to respect her. She's older than him. Now. Then Al-Miswar and Abdul Rahman. Miswar, Miswar. Al-Miswar and Abdul Rahman began to plead with Aisha radiallahu anha to speak to him and accept him. They said, you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade cutting people off and you know that it is not lawful for a Muslim to refuse to speak to his brother Muslim 
for longer than three nights. You see, this is the fruit of bringing somebody who is knowledgeable and righteous. Radiallahu an and Miswar, radiallahu an Abdul Rahman. They are not normal people. They are as well close from the side of the mother of the Prophet sallam, and also they are knowledgeable and they are righteous people. So those righteous people, when you bring them along, they will, you know, help you. So here, they, these two, they said to her, you know, while he's pleading, so he's pleading from the inside, and they are from the outside, they could hear the crying, they could hear the hugging of Abdullah ibn Zubayr, but they are as well encouraging. They said, you know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had forbade a hijrah. Hijrah means like boycotting, not the migration, the migrating of the person. Hijrah, that is the boycotting of a person, and it's not halal, lawful, for a Muslim to boycott his brother, the Muslim, for over than three days. Which means the person can boycott his brother for less than three days if something had happened. So within the three days, no problem. So if, for example, I disputed with my brother today, tonight, I've got 72 hours. That is, tomorrow, the after tomorrow, the after tomorrow, and that's it. By night, I have to stop it. Otherwise, both of us will be in major sin. And this is to do with dunya. Dunya. Dunya means regarding dunya matters, not regarding the hereafter. As we go for the hereafter, it is a must upon the person to boycott the Ahlul Bid'ah. And not three days, three hundred years. You, know? you have to boycott them. You can't mix up with them. But as our Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah had said, which is as well based upon what the scholars had said, Shaykh al Taymiyyah, that the boycotting is still like a medicine, used at the right time or the right amount. So even the religious one, we tell the person, the religious one, if you're going to boycott that person and it's going to make him into more, more dalal, then you should not do so. But if the boycotting will stop him from his dalal and his deviance, yes, do it. So we don't want the boycotting to take place and then you, this person goes more haram and more haram, you know, because you are the only person, the only hope for him to come back, but you are still insisting on boycotting him. So what am I saying? that you need to ask the people of knowledge regarding such a situation. Shall I boycott him or not? This person, blah, 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 he did, you know, he is, for example, he smokes and he's, and I'm not affected with his smoke and everything, but shall I communicate with him or not? So this would be individual sort of fatwa. It's better to do that other than, other than uh, I mean, then you maybe that person, instead of now just smoking, he will start what? Drinking. And then start what? Womanizing. Instead of that, then stealing. So you, maybe it's better for you to stick with him if you're not affected. So the boycotting, you should be careful in using it and you should be very as well uh, uh, observative regarding the boycotting of the dunya. Dunya, you have only three days. You cannot pass the three days. So uh, if you boycotted him tonight, we don't say you got until the following day, uh, until the, the fourth day, the third day, during the night. So 72 hours. We don't want to increase that. <laughs> Right, so when they have increased in saying that you should not, you should not, now they, said, con they continued to remind her and press her until she began to remind them of her vow and weep, saying, I have made a vow and the vow is a serious thing. They persisted with her until she spoke to Ibn Zubair and then she had 40 slaves set free to atone for breaking her vow. Even after that, she had 40 slaves set free whenever she remembered her vow and she would weep she would weep until her tears made her veil wet right now we could see here that the two righteous people and Miswar and Abdul Rahman they both insisted with Abdullah ibn Zubayr from inside as well insisting until she had given up. She stays still saying that the oath and the oath and the vow and the oath, but they reminded her that you could, you know, even as an oath, and it's even as a vow, if a person had seen a better than the oath, he should really break his oath. So if the person had said boycotted somebody, and he made an oath, and then he said, he thought maybe boycotting him is no good, then he breaking the oath would be better rather than keeping the oath. But if the person made an oath regarding something, which is if you have done it or left it, it will be haram, then you should keep your oath. So a person says, by Allah, vow upon me to keep my obligatory prayer. Can you break his oath? <laughs> we can't. There's no such thing, you break an oath. By Allah, I vow to Allah, 
I'm going to leave fornication. Can you break your oath? You should not break your oath. I'm going to break my oath and make kafar. Huh? What is that? I'm going to fornicate and make kafar. How can you do that? So vowing for something which is, that if you leave it, if you do it, it will be telling haram, and you should not break that oath. But yeah, the oath, it looks like that the oath, if, you, if Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he had uh, pleaded with his maternal aunt, he's got relationship in blood, he's got relationship of as well that she's a mother of the believer, got the relationship of as well that she's sister in Islam, all that relationship, uh, it is better for Aisha radiallahu anha to break the oath. Now, when she broke the oath, she started weeping, weeping not just for the breaking of the oath, weeping as well, because it's her, you know, her nephew, she loves him. And I said he was the third in rank after the Prophet of Allah and after Abu Bakr. But it shows you as well that love in the heart of a female, she's like a mother to Abdullah ibn Zubair. She's like a mother. That love, and you know that the custody of the child, if the mother goes, goes to the maternal aunt. Because she loves him so much, that love can be taken away. Like the love of the mother, if you do something wrong, it could be what? Snatched. If you did something bad, it could be snatched. So she said, I'm not going to speak to you. Now, uh, we understand from this that the person who is, you know, doing something good, he should insist on, you know, persisting that you have to do that good. So if somebody is really hesitant to do it, go keep insisting, don't leave him. And that's how the Prophet ﷺ insisted in the Battle of Al-Hudaybi. In the Battle of Al-Hudaybi, when the Prophet ﷺ was camping on the outskirt of Mecca, and Hudaybah is the area where after it will be you know, within the sanctity area of Mecca. So Hudaybah camped there and the people of Quraysh they wanted him to go back. That's the year 6 after Hijrah. So they sent him, you know, negotiators, Arwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, Mikraz uh, and uh, others as well. And then they came, the person who came, Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr. His name is Suhail. Suhail means easy. As soon as the Prophet said, Allah, I made your matter easy. As soon as he saw him coming. So he came, Suhail, and he made the agreement with the Prophet. In that agreement, that any person coming from the people of Quraysh embracing Islam is to go back. But any person from the Muslim committing apostasy and he wants to follow the people of Quraysh, they will not send him back. Now that look, look, looks like a humiliating sort of condition. But the Prophet accepted it. Why? Because he knows what is coming ahead. And he knows it's going to be a full repossession of the whole Mecca. It will give him time to send, you know, letters and make people to embrace Islam. You know, the war is no good. So the Suhail, so while he was doing this uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu the contract, Abu Jandil comes, which is the son of Suhail. And he was running away from the people of Quraysh. So he threw himself into the hands of the Muslims. So Suhail, he said, this one is the first person I will judge you for. That means you're going to be fulfilling your contract. So the Prophet said, the contract hasn't finished yet. We haven't signed it yet. And he said, no, I will not accept until, who's that? His son. He comes back, you send him back. So he was pleading, he's looking at Abu Bakr, looking at Umar. You send me back to Kufr on humiliation after I came here? And the Prophet had kept pleading with Suhail. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this topic. Is he kept pleading, he did not leave just this one, just, just keep it on, yeah, leave this one, keep a closed eye. He said, no, he kept insisting. So here we find that the Prophet sallallahu he was insisting. Also that it is a habit, the person, you know, he wants something, he will all the time insist. Now, radiallahu anha wa ardaha, she, after the insisting, she broke her oath and she hugged her. She talked to him and she started crying. And every time she remembers this incident, she cries. And she had for set free 40 slaves. That's a lot of fortune. 40 slaves. She doesn't need to do that. But she kept doing it because she said it's an oath and it's something oath that can't violate it. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a, it's a vow. So she kept, she didn't do them on go, she kept uh, freeing the slaves until they became 40. Aisha the law, she was well known to keep, you know, to free the slaves. Uh, even we have a narration that uh, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he sent her 10 slaves, she set them free. Now we find in this hadith, weeping from the fear of Allah, person as well, he needs to all the time account for himself, and also 
his repentance should be, should be sincere. And we find as well, Aisha being scrupulous. And we find as well, the excellence of bringing those people who are righteous. And they are insisting upon the good. And also we find Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anh, insisting to rectify between him and Aisha. And not to fulfill the boycotting, not to go ahead with the boycotting. And it is haram to boycott the Muslim, uh, uh, his brother, over three days regarding dunya matters. Regarding the deen, it depends, as I said. And we come now to more details of this boycotting. And that is, Babu Hijratil Muslim. Now. Chapter 189, Separating from a Muslim. Hadith 398. Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, neither hate one another, nor envy, nor shun one another. Slaves of Allah be as brothers. It is not lawful for a Muslim to refuse to speak to his brother Muslim for more than three nights. Can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, neither hate one another. Okay, neither hate one another. Hating one another, that means don't make things that would in care that this person will hate you. So, because when you hate a person, then this will bring the grudge in the heart. And this will break the links of the brotherhood and the love. For Fadi the Prophet وسلم, he said, you will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. Shall I inform you of something if you do, you love one another? He said, Afshu salam, say salam. And this is Sayyidina Muslim. Muslim. So, if you hate one another, you're not gonna love one another. That means this will affect your iman. That means you will not enter paradise. That's the link. Shall I? You will not enter paradise until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. So that's the love. So if you hate, you're not gonna love. So it shows us here that it is prohibited upon the person to hate his brother. And because this hate will you see, if hate goes into levels. So start with hate, and after that you are rejecting him, and then you become enmity, the last thing. So hate, first stage, and after the hate you will, every time you see him you want to keep away from him, and then the third stage you will is their enmity. And the enmity cannot be between the brothers. Whereas the love, as well, is, is, is three stages as well. First stage, affiliation. Second stage, the will. And then the third stage, the love and the affection. Same thing like with the hate, you start with the hate. And then, you know, second stage, you know, every time you see him, you want to go away. And then the third stage, which is the enmity. And this is haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَاَعْتَصِمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا And hold on to the rope of Allah all together. Yes, you could hate in the sake of Allah. Yes. But not only that, it is actually from the points of Iman to sake in the sake of Allah. I'm not hating the brother, I'm hating him for the sake of Allah. That is, I'm telling him, don't fornicate, still fornicating. I hate you for the sake of Allah because you are what? You are doing what this pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm hating him for the sake of Allah, not because of the sake of the dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brought this religion to get us together. This is the point, you know the point why we have Sharia. To love one another. This Sharia, all of it. Ad-Deenul Nasiha. The whole religion is about what? Nasiha. Qalli man ya Rasulullah. To whom must you Allah? Lillahi wa Rasuli. Lillahi wa Rasuli means you are fulfilling the obligations and keeping away from prohibited acts. Wa li aimati al-Muslimin wa li aimati. That is also to the leaders and to the aimati. And how can you have a nusr, an advice to a person if you don't love him? You have to love him to have an advice. If you don't love him, you don't have advice, indeed. So you have to love him to advise him. So a deal nasiha. It's like when you have a hajj arafah. The most important pillar in hajj is arafah. The most important pillar in deen is nasiha. Because it's all the sharia is came is that for you to love one another and also to hate those who are, you know, bad with Allah. So you see, you have a relationship between yourself and yourself. 
relationship between yourself and the people, and a relationship between yourself and Allah. So when you do zulm, you're gonna break the relation with yourself with Allah, and break the relationship between yourself and the people, and break yourself as well between yourself and yourself. So the person who is a mushrik is a zalim, because he had broke the relation, or he had violated what is between him and Allah, the relation. And if he is unjust to the people, he robbed them, and he hits them, and he swears at them, then he is violent to the people. And if the person starts stealing and drinking and eating, usually he is violent to himself. So remember that the Sharia came is to make us to hold on to the rope of Allah. How can we hold on to the rope of Allah together if we hate another, one another? Right. So we say loving one another is the base and foundation for unity. No unity will not be taking place if you have hate towards another, one another. And that is why from the description of those people who enter paradise, We will take whatever grudge in their hearts, brothers, when they verily no way you can enter the paradise when you have hatred to your brothers. We will take whatever in their chest from the hatred. Brothers on couches opposite one another. So this person needs to know that hatred is the foundation for split and love is the foundation for unity. So the meaning here, you should not hate one another. And also some of the scholars, they said that means you should not in, go onto a route or a path that will take you to hate one another. For verily, you know that uh, uh, you have a choice. Can somebody just choose your phone, please? So you, you have a choice, you know, in the hatred. So if you do something, you know that your brother hates it. You should not do it. So as I said, it starts with hate and it ends up with enmity. Now, second one, he said, "Wala," and don't. Um, second one. Nor envy. Nor envy. Wala tahasad. Al hasad. Al Hasad, the Prophet ﷺ, he combined this in another hadith, in Sunan al Tirmidhi. The disease of those nations before you had crept into you. Al Hasad wa Al Baghdad. Al Hasad, the envy, and Al Baghdad, Al Baghdad, the hatred. So he had combined the Hasad wa Al Baghdad in a hadith on its own. He, stopped, he said, It is a disease of those people who were before you, and it's crept into this Ummah. It is the shaiva. It does not It does not shave the hair, but it shaves off the religion. Al Hasad wal Baghda. The envy. Why do you envy a person? Do you envy somebody whom you love? I'm asking. Do you envy somebody whom you love? Do you envy your wife? You don't, because you love her. Unless you hate her something else. But you love your wife, you don't envy her. Same thing with the wife who does not envy her husband. And it's, it is in the human being, it is a nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it inside, that this person, he has that sort of instinct in him to be competing with those who are on the same level. So we find, for example, the doctors envy one another. You don't find a doctor, for example, envies... You don't find a doctor who envies, for example, a floor sweeper or a kitchen chef. He will not. So, for example, a kitchen chef, he made the best of steaks. The doctor will not be, you know, sort of envy. But if somebody chef, another one like him, he will envy him. True or not? They always envy him. Same thing. So, engineers will envy engineers. Doctors will envy doctors. You will not find a doctor will envy, as I said, an engineer because they are competing in different, in different kind of different fields. And the hazard is a three, three levels. The envy. first one which is called al ghitta which is hala. That is, you find somebody who's got something good, you say to him Mubarak, and at the same time you wish that you got the same. No problem. But, will get you tired. This will get you tired, it's no problem, there's no, no haram into it, but it'll get you tired because every time you find something, the other brother you've got, and you're gonna hope for it, that means you're gonna get all the time in agony. So, the brother had, for example, uh, this, uh, for example, nice car, Mercedes. Ah, oh, I wish I had a Mercedes. You think about it. And then you got a Mercedes. And then you got another, oh, it's got a Lamborghini. I wish I had a Lamborghini. 
Huh? And you go up and up, you will never, you will never be sort of satisfied. So the dunya is nothing. The dunya is worth nothing. You only think about what the akhir. Allahumma la aisha illa aishul akhir. Very, there is no aish, no living except the aish of al-akhir, the hereafter. This is the aish that you are after, right? <laughs> Second level is the level of that the person envies a person. He wishes for his blessings to be. Uh, taken away from him and come back to him. That's the second one. So he sees a car, somebody. I wish that he's got no car and this car comes to me. Okay? He's got a nice wife, wish that wife can be divorced from him and come to me. So that's an envy, which is the second level. And the third level, which is the worst, is just you hope that he does not have the blessings. Second one is even less evil because the one is, I want it to come to me. Rather than this one, as long as he hasn't got it, I'm happy. <laughs> Did you understand the third level? It's the worst. Worst of all. As long as, so you are all the time happy when he is in calamities. And you are all the time in misery if he's got something nice. A'udhu Billah. So every time your brother's got something nice, <sighs> why? Huh? Boils in your mouth. And when, some, when something, you know, he lost. He lost his house. You know, you might shake your head in front of the people. Oh, Alhamdulillah, he lost his house, you know. I don't know, how did you get it? How did you get it? Huh? That's the, that's the hassle. Third level of the hassle. Right, now we come to the first crime. The first crime was committed on the face of the earth. That is, the crime because of the hassle. Qabil killed Habib. Qabil killed Habib. Why? Because he was envy. He was envy. He envied him because Allah accepted his sacrificial, did not accept his his. He killed him. The first crime that took place, it was envy. That is, Iblis. The first sin that took place was envy. Why did Iblis? Why did Iblis refuse to prostrate to Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prostrate to, to Adam. Because of the envy. He made me better than him. I am from the fire, he's from the clay. How can you command this protection of something that is made of something which is less than me? But you are fulfilling the command of Allah. There's no question. Command of Allah, you don't question. Why are you asking me how this? And that's the arrogance, because of the envy. And that's why he's expelled from the hell, from the paradise, forever. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Jews to be the, from the envy and lots of places in the Quran. And the kuffar used to envy the Prophet at that time. What the kathir min ahl kitabi law yaruddunakum an ba'da imanikum kuffara. Hasadan. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, lots of people of the book, they want you to go as kafir after you became Muslim. Why? Hasadan. That is, hasadan means it's an envy. Hasadan min indi and fusi. That is because they have envy from themselves towards you. They want you to go back to kuffar. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that uh, and the people, the kuffar, the idolaters, they want to even make you slip out of their evil eye, out of their envy to you. They want to slip, O Muhammad. So we find that that the envier We'll talk about him a bit more. We say that uh, always the envies, the enviers, the ones who envy, always brothers with the shaitan. They always hate the people who are righteous. And you see, the whole time they don't like if the blessings goes into the brothers. This envy doesn't like the brother, the brothers to have these blessings. And but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, if He wants to bring out a blessing that He's given to a slave. What does he do? He makes a hasid to mention it on his tongue. Do you understand that? So if a blessings of a person that he's a half of Quran, always makes him qiyam. Alright? So he does not say to anybody, but this person knew about it. Because he's a hasid, he tells it to the people. So if he told it himself, maybe he would be showing off. But now this hasid, he had brought out the goodness. So you're trying to you know, bring hatred to him and you have to be brought love to him. 
And that is why we say the Hasid, the Enviya, is the enemy of himself. The Hasid, the Enviya, he had opposed Allah from five ways. Number one, that he has uh, uh, disliked and hated every blessings that it came on somebody other than himself. So if he sees the blessings on somebody else, he hates it. So he is actually challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, that he will be not happy for what Allah has given him. So the destiny, he's not really accepting it. Why has he got something and I haven't got it? Third issue, that he is opposing the action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah, you know, through his decree had imposed for this, to have the blessing, and him, he hasn't got it, then he's opposing the action of Allah azza wa jal. And also he had let down those who are awliya. So this person is challenging Allah by letting them down, those people who are friends of Allah. And you are wishing that this blessing that Allah is giving to his awliya to be taken away. Also, a fifth one, that he had helped the enemy Iblis. And that is his enemy as well. He helped him. And verily, the hasad will, you will reap five things out of it. When the hasad takes place, you will reap five things. Number one, <laughs> you will have your obedience to be taken away. So all the deed that you have done, you have corrupted it with your hasad, with your envy. See, the person who has got, you know, fire in his heart towards his brothers, towards whatever brother has got a blessing, verily he's a hostage for the shaitan. And the shaitan is, had made him oblivious. And he had basically uh, come to Allah Azza wa poor and he has no hasanat in himself and that is what the shaitan wants from his followers also number two that he had you know when you make this masiyah, uh, uh, yani, uh, when you make this hasad it, it, it entails you to make the masiyah. why because you see the hasad the envier has three sides all the time it is when you see him he will start Use hypocrisy. You know, like you're smiling to you. And if you are away, he will start back by you. And if you have a calamity, he's happy with it. Those are the three signs of the hippie. But that's why we say that it brings more sins. So number one, this person, as soon as you see him, he will start smiling to you. And if you think that you are, he's good in the mashallah, he's happy with your house and your car and everything. But when you go out, he start back by you. And the third one is happy when something happens to you wrong, something wrong happens to you. Also, this person, he, the hasad will entail, and this person will read the following. He will be all the time in, you know, all continuous disaster, continuous agony. Because his brothers has took this and he's got this and he hasn't got it. So it's in continuous, and I'm telling you, wallahi. Uh, what we're going to talk about in a minute, inshallah, what are the, re the fruits are reaped by the ones who have been envied, not the envy, the one who is envied. And the fifth one, he's been deprived. He has been deprived and he is disgraced. He's deprived, he's envied. Because he cannot get what he wants and he could never gain victory upon his enemies. Why? Because every time he gets a blessing, he still wants another blessing. So if he wants, if he sees you, he wants it, he wants it. So he will never fulfill what he wishes. And also, how can he gain victory against his enemies when his enemies are the believers, the good brothers? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give him victory over his enemies. It is incumbent upon us to give uh, victory to those who are believers. As for the one who's been envied, then there is no harm upon him. Don't worry. You just protect yourself. Yes, he might have the eye, evil eye, and something happened, but there is, you have to gain the benefit all the time. Because we say to the person, as for in your deen, you have a benefit. You are a mazloom, and the mazloom supplication is fulfilled. Somebody who's envied you, like somebody's done magic to you. You are a mazloom. And every time you make a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supplication will be fulfilled. So this person who had Envied his brother, his brother, he is a mazloom. And when he makes supplication, and his supplication will be fulfilled. And also in this dunya, you see, what is your target as a Muslim, as yourself? You see, your target is all the time to be victorious upon your enemy. 
and to make your enemy in the most miserable situation. Now, how can he get him more miserable than what he is, the envy? If you try to do your best to get him miserable, you can't be better than himself doing it to himself. Do you understand that? If you want to bring misery to this envy, you can't bring him more than what he's doing to himself. He's all the time thinking, how can you get this? How did you get this? I wish that you don't have this. And Allah give you more blessings upon blessings. And he is, is killing him. So you are actually killing him by not killing him directly. Do you understand me? And this is, I think, I think this is the target of everybody. So if this envier looked at this carefully and weighed, you know, the goods and the bads, he will know that he is actually the friend of his enemy and he's the enemy of himself. True or not? He is the enemy of himself and he is the friend of his enemy. And that is why we find the scholars had said, when this person had envied, he had actually made himself the most despicable person, and most hated person, the mean person in this life and the hereafter. And not only that, he had made Iblis to be happy. Why? Because Iblis, he's, he is the most enemy to you. And you made happy because he had seen you all the time now, uh, deprived from the, from the blessings. So if, and th that blessing, why are you deprived? Because you don't love your brother. And Iblis trying to make you hate your brother. To envy him. Because if you love him in the sake of Allah, what would you do? You would say, MashaAllah, you have a nice car. MashaAllah, you have a nice And you'll be happy. And then you get the same reward as that person. And Iblis doesn't want that to happen. MashaAllah, you're a half of MashaAllah. You are a nice righteous person. MashaAllah. Once you do that, even if you are not capable physically, or you're not capable because your level of understanding is not as good as that person, for example, to get the same money as him. He's an air pilot, but you can't. You are a person who's good in just making coffee, for example. But this, when you say, MashaAllah, Allah bless you with money, MashaAllah, you're getting the same rewards. Your Allah is giving you the rewards because of what? The love to your brothers. And Shaitan doesn't want that to happen. And that is why we say the envier is the enemy of himself and he's the friend of his enemy. So it pleases all the time, it's in fear that this person love what Allah had blessed his brothers with regarding this dunya so he will with this love gain more rewards Iblis is not telling you to do, to do that he's telling you to do the opposite then he said well, I don't know. nor shun one another shun one another the dawah is that you, every person has his back to the back of his brother that's what it means so he is going away which is a result of envy and a result of hatred. So it's a result. Because once you have this hatred, once you have this hasad, you will turn away from each other. That's what it means. And then here the emphasis says, Slaves of Allah, be as brothers. Be as brothers. No, no, he said, be brothers. Be slaves of Allah, brothers. Be slaves of Allah and brothers. Be slaves of Allah and brothers. Well, the slaves of Allah cannot be except that they are brothers. So if that means, O oh, Ibad Allah, O oh, slaves of Allah, be brothers. So it is here a hint that you are the slaves of Allah. And because you are the slaves of Allah, your religion is one, your prophet is one, your God is one. So you should not hate one another. You should not have your back to one another. You should not envy one another. You should love one another. Because this is what's going to get you to Iman. And the Iman is going to get you to paradise. So you should be dealing with each other in the best of ways. With upon righteousness, upon love, on all of that. Kuru ikhka ikhwa. Be like the brothers of blood. How the brothers of blood? Usually this is the case, they are brothers. But sometimes you find brothers, even blood, they hate one another. Why? Because there's no religion. But like the blood brothers, be like you when they love one another. Be the same thing as well. Right. Now, we find the last one. It is not lawful for a Muslim to refuse to speak to his brother Muslim for, for more than three nights. So he's been forgiven for th three nights, but more than that is haram if it's to do with matters. If it's to do, to do with the deen, we said, yes, you must keep away from the people of Ahl al-Bid'ah, the ones who call you to Bid'ah. But if the person was upon something which is sin or something like this, then boycotting him, it depends. Is it good or is it not good? So you have to ask somebody if you don't know how to do and how to deal with it. 399? 399. 
Abu Ayyub radiallahu anhu, the companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, it is not lawful for anyone to cut himself off from his brother Muslim for more than three nights. It's in not such lawful, what is lawful? It's, uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's not lawful, yes, yeah. for the person to cut his brother for more than three nights. Three yes. nights in such a way that when they meet, each turns his face away, avoiding the other. The better of them is the one who initiates the greeting. So it's not lawful and it's haram. And we have discussed this hadith. And it is as well to show that it is a proof that once you say salam, that boycotting had stopped. Boycotting stopped. If you just salam on And it is obvious. You know, when you have a boycotting with a brother, we don't expect you to go and hug each other from the first time. We don't expect you to invite one another to the house, especially if there was something really big, big issue. So, Allah made it easy for us to start with what? With a salam. Just salamu alaykum, alhamdulillah, I'm not boycotting him anymore. And that salam, whether I said it like this, or I sent him a message. If he's not there, send him a message. Make sure that he gets it before the three days. So, brother, salamu alaykum, alaykum. Make sure he gets it. Otherwise, you're going to be a major sin. Or you wrote something to him, you sent him a letter. Make sure it's first class. <laughs> Doesn't delay. As long as you have broken with anything, to easy, break your eyes. Be easy situation. Then after that, things take place. As we said regarding that poet, when we say that the person is not supposed to, you know, uh, have a look at the girls. Because that, and the look it will end up to something more. Now, Dr. start with a look. Fatisamatun smile. Fasalam hi. Fakalam talk. Fanawidun randivu. Faliqa the people of another. That's the poetry. So it started with what? With a spark. Ended up with a big fire. What's the spark? The look. Just have a look. That look with a woman ended up with fornication wa Right, same thing here we said, no, but this is halal. We said that we start with a salam and then we end up inshallah with hugging. End up with hugging later on. So salam. As long as you say salam, you are alhamdulillah outside the haram, mashallah. An Abi Hurayata radiallahu anhu. 400. 400. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, The Prophet sallallahu said, Do not hate one another nor contend with one another. Contend with another. This is the one contend or compete. Contend with another. That is, the person he is trying to have something just for himself, nobody else. Or he's competing all the time to get the dunya. Content or not, it's just the dunya, dunya, what's get possession. He is not even satisfied, always dunya. So can't, dunya, don't start, you know, he's got a bigger house than mine, let me go and get a bigger house than him. He's got a nice car than me, you are not going to finish. You remember when we said the envy three times, the first, the first one, you try to get the same blessing, but you're not really, you know, saying that, oh Allah, deprive him from the blessing. But still you are, every time you see something, you want it. That's not good. Because you're not, you're not going to finish. And I know how, a person who is really tired, they go, oh, my wife, you're giving me time. I say, what? And every time, her friend, they get a house, I have to get bigger than that house. And they ended up now in a mansion, by the way. Big mansion, mashallah. So I don't know if her friends get a mansion, she wants now a palace. <laughs> Uh, he had to buy a mansion for a one million pound just to satisfy her. Look at that. Because she doesn't want it that one of the wife to come there and to see that her house look at that. Subhanallah. They've never been said. They never wish sort of envy to each other, but this is a type of what? The tanafis. Why, why you compete? Tanafis with Akhirah. He's got five verses memorized. I've memorized. Five surah, I've memorized six surah. That's the tanafis. I will memorize more than him. Yes. MashaAllah, that gives you more memorization of the Quran. Right. Then he says, Slaves of Allah, be as brothers. And be slaves of Allah. We have discussed that as well. So we be brothers. Because if you are brothers, you all the time will help one another. Naam. Hadith 401. Anas radiallahu anhu said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Two persons who love each other for Allah or for Islam should not estrange each other except when one of them first indulge in a sin. Read again, please. 
And as he said, the Prophet said, two persons who love each other for Allah or for Islam should not estrange each other. What does estrange mean? Like separate. Yeah, separate from each other. Should not separate from each other. Except separate when one of no. Except. Um, uh, except when one of them first indulges in a sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, does it really? So, uh, the translation of this hadith says, any two people who had loved one another for the sake of Allah and Islam, nothing will separate between them except, except, nothing will separate between them except that a sin, one of them has done it. It's a very great hadith. Mm. So if you have, for example, your brother had changed you. You know you got a brother, mashallah, you love one another. And something and something had happened. And your brother has just turned his face away from you. And you could brother. It must have been what? A sin. Either him or you are done. Investigate yourself. Do you understand that? Because Allah is going to reflect that sin. And this is to show that the sin entails lots of things. Entails the deprivation of the barakah, the deprivation even of the nafa, the wealth, your provision. So you, you, your provision will go away as well as a Muslim. So the, 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 the sin, it's like a bomb. You know, when you throw a bomb, you've got lots of destruction, exactly the same as the sin. It takes you down from the place you've got, you are up, up, or you are sin, you fall down. So you keep going down. So it, this is the implication or the, uh, the, the, the bad things that the result of the sin. So the person, he knows that the sin takes him to disgrace and humiliation. Where is the ta'ah? This is the blessing. From this is what we take, the ta'ah, the obedience takes you up and elevates you. And makes you beloved and loved, you know. The people would love you, even to see the iman in your face and mashallah the light and everything. They love you because of the ta'ah. So he says it here that because of that sin, Allah Azza wa had separated between both of you. And you are, you love one another, but because of that sin. So be careful. 402. 402, Hisham bin Amir al-Ansari, the cousin of Anas bin Malik, radiallahu uh, anhu, whose father was martyred in the Battle of Uhud, said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, it is not lawful for a Muslim to snub another Muslim for more than three nights. What's that mean? Hmm? Don't talk to him, yeah? Boycott him, yes. As long as they are cut off from each other, they are turning away from the truth. The first of them to return to proper relations has expiated for that failing in as much as he has the first to do so. So the first of them to return to proper relations has expiated for that failing in as much as he has the first to do so. He was the first to do so. He was the first, yeah, that's makes sense. As much as, and he was, yes, he was. Okay. He was the first to do so. That means he would be get the expiation because he was the first to get to rectify between him and brother. Yes, go ahead. If they die while they are cut off from each other, neither of them will ever enter the garden. If one of them greets the other and he refuses to return the greeting or accept his greeting, then an angel returns the greeting to him and Satan answers to the uh, answers the other. Right. Masha, this hadith is a great hadith. It tells us it is major sin for a Muslim to snob to boycott his brother for over three days regarding the dunya matters. But as long as they are like this, they are away from the house. And the first one to make the salam, to start to initiate and to stop this boycotting is the one who's got the kafar, he's been expiated. As for the other one, he has to make, not just to accept the salam, to do more for expiation, to do more than that. He has to go along with this rectification, go you know, back to the brother. So the first one, as soon as he says, salamu alaikum, he had expiated for what he has done. And if they have died upon their boycotting, in even a narration which we have discussed before, 127. That is, if even if one of them dies, because if one of them dies, you don't have this option, the, the chance to go what? Rectify, he's dead. Imagine that he dies and you are with him. 
You can't talk to each other? Allahu Akbar. That's a great, a great loss for you. What are you going to do? He's not there. Both of you, you will be destroyed. He said, if, and if they died, or one of them died on the hadith, died. They died upon this boycotting, they will not enter paradise forever. What does that mean? The kuffar? That means will not enter paradise until this hatred removed. Remember? They cannot enter paradise when they hate one another. They have to enter paradise loving one another. But it means as well they're going to be delayed. And it means you could be thrown through the hellfire because of this hatred. So, verily, grab the chance and don't be scared. Don't wait for the brother to, you do it. And don't say, oh, I'm not going to stop until he starts. Because this is my dignity in the light. No, brother, there's no dignity. There's hellfire. Forget about the dignity. Got to dip you into the hellfire. What's the dignity, you know, worth with the, with the hellfire? You're going to be in the hellfire. I'm going to be deprived from paradise. I want paradise. Forget about the dignity this one. I don't want, there's no dignity in their life. Well, why there's no dignity? You just say salam. Just send them a text, salamu alaikum. He might take the salam and he phones you. Alhamdulillah, he started with that. If he doesn't, if he doesn't phone you, text him again. Tease him. <laughs> huh? Because he might say, I didn't see a text. <laughs> or your email goes to the junk. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Shaitan can tell him, you know, any excuse now. SubhanAllah. So, and then he says, if he had said the salam to him. So you are scared now. Maybe I'll say the salam to him. And he is going to, you know, turn me down. You're not going to say salam back. So that's, I'm, my dignity went down the line now. That's what it is, isn't it? Don't, f you know, I'll tell you what. You want your brother to say salam, but if he did not say salam, you should be happy. Who will return the salam for you? Angel. And the angel, when he returns the salam, he's a sinless creature. His supplication, or alika salam, is more fulfilled, or more likely to be fulfilled, than a person like myself who is sinning. So the angel, imagine the angel say, ah, wa alika salam, peace be upon you. I want the angel. And does, is the angel who said, salam is responded all the time, so is the angels dua responded all the time? We said what? Do we ask this question before? Is the angels supplication responded all the time? If he makes a supplication, is it fulfilled straight away? Yes or no? Put your finger up. Mm. So yes. So I'm holding to you. Say yes. You say yes. So if for example, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, if you make a supplication to your brother while he's absent, there's an angel, he says, and for you the same, supplication. Would you get what you asked for your brother? So you want a wife. So you say to the brother, may Allah grant you a wife. So the angel says, inshallah, for you the same. Would you get the wife? Definitely, 100%? I'm talking about the dunya, the akhirah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not fulfilled all the time. It's more likely to be fulfilled. But it's not fulfilled all the time. All right? It is not fulfilled all the time. Okay, that's the, you have to know that. So, uh, and there's a story here, there's a story of the, the angel who came to the person who was leopard, and the person who was bold, the person who was blind. It's a long story. He made a supplication, the angel's supplication was not fulfilled. So, it's not all the time the angel's supplication is to be fulfilled. But it's more likely to be fulfilled than mine. So if he said salamu alaykum, he did not answer, alhamdulillah, alaykum salam. And also, the shaitan said salam to the person who's what? Who did not return. He said to him, thank you very much for not returning the salam. Keep up like this, brother. <laughs> He's your brother, shaitan's brother. Keep up, keep it up, brother. That means don't answer him. Because what you're doing now, that is going to make guarantee for me, you're going to be into the helper. And that's my job, to chuck you in the helper. So you have done good job for the shaitan. So the shaitan means when he replies to the other, that means he is thanking him. He is thanking him. You're a good champion. Yes, be like this. You be a man. Don't answer him. Why? Because he wants to dip you in the hellfire. You're a loser. Say, wa alaikum salam straight away. And you should be as well, working your nails. Why did he start before me? I should have been the first to start. Because he got expiation. And I need to do something more now for my expiation. So say salam before him. Grab this opportunity after we have told you what we have told you. Right, I stop here inshallah. What is the hadith that I said I'm going to show the number for you? Just to make sure that I'm... Generosity of, of Aisha. Aisha and Asma. Okay. 
The hadith is 280. Nah. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Fadl. Yes, correct. Correct translation. No, no, the hadith is correct. This is the hadith, just like other hadiths, where the Prophet وسلم, and even Allah in the Quran, the person who kills his brother, mutaamid, that means deliberate, he will be in the hellfire forever. Say like this. He will be in the hellfire forever. Khalidan fiha. So now what is forever? You have to interpret it in the light of the principle. That is the principle qa'idat al wa'id wa The principle of the promise and wa'id which is the threatening. What is the promise and what? What Allah had promised, he will fulfill. And what Allah had threatened, he might fulfill, he might not fulfill. That's the qa'idah, okay? We have summoned or they have collected this qa'idah from a number of texts. Otherwise, we're going to end up chucking our people into the hellfire forever. Because they have insulted their brothers. See, Babu Muslim Fusuk wa Kitalu Kufr. Or because he fought with his brother. Or because he had backbiting a brother. Because of some of the. He will not enter paradise. And because of that, we say, as long as the person has gotten monotheism, tawheed in his heart, this tawheed will make him into the hadith, which is the hadith of Bitaqa. Uh, and the hadith is shafa, the two hadith, well known. Bitaqa means the card, and the shafa is the decision. What is the hadith of Bitaqa? Is the person who has been given 99 scrolls, all of them evil deeds. Nothing, no good in them. And he was brought to the day of resurrection where there is a day of justice. There's no day, there's no vulm on that day. He would say to the man, Do you deny anything on that? He looks and he's got a scan now because, as I said, the person will be after, he will have different body, different way of thinking, different way of looking. He would scan all of that 99. Straight away, he said, No, no, Lord, I don't deny anything. Did my, Allah would ask, did my angels who write the deeds wrong you? He said, No, he did not wrong you. Everything's correct here. Do you have any hasan? Now, with that scanning of his, he saw something maybe there, but he didn't consider it as a hasan. He said, No, there's no hasan for me. He said, No, there is. Man, he can't see Hassan. Can't see something that he's done good. So he said, there is. For verily there is no injustice will be. This is the day of justice. There will be nothing injustice upon you. Well, you know, you'll not be wronged. And then a bitaqa will be wrong. A bitaqa is the card. And you will see it. And the bitaqa says, La ilaha illallah. Which is more often, Tawheed. And he believes in Allah Azza wa Jalla. There's no shirk. So he bitaqa. So he says, La ilaha illallah. So he said, oh Allah, he could see that bitaqa, he could see that hasan as well in his records. But he can't see that how can this, you know, is gonna outweigh those, all of these 99 scrolls of evil deeds. He said, and he, it's a hasan, but it's not he. So he said, don't worry, there will be no injustice done to you today. So there will be a scale, and this is the scale which we believe, a mizan, two pounds. The pan will be pulling the 99 scrolls. This is the pan to show that the scale weighs as well the deeds. So the deeds will turn into weights. The evil will turn. And la ilaha illallah will turn into weight, which is against it. The weight of la ilaha illallah will be heavier than the weight of those 99 scrolls of evil. So in that, in those evil deeds, it could be as well this person did not love one another, or did not, he did not love his brother, all of that. Second hadith, and also a person who did not pray, in that hadith, we also going to pray. The hadith of Shafa'a, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes the people to intercede, the angels to intercede, the prophets to intercede, the shahada, the martyrs to intercede. And then every intercession, they will take, bring the one who's got you know, the weight of a mustard of a man in his heart. Mustard seed. The weight of an atom. There's nothing. Even Allah will bring out, and He will yakbidu qabbah. He will take a handful from the hellfire. People who are turned into turn completely as a cold. Nothing. And they will put them into the life water. They will grow like the and the body will grow exactly like the you know the the, 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 the stem or the, the, the uh, plant will grow into a very nice moist compost sort of land. 
quickly. And those people who done no good whatsoever, except for Tawheed, they come out with the intercession of the Almighty. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whether they have been insulting each other or killing one another, as long as they do the Tawheed. Monotheism. But it has to be monotheism. If there is a shirk, shirk al-akbar, major shirk, he will be in the hellfire forever. Shirk al-akbar. Shaykh al Taymiyyah said, Shirk al-Asr will not be forgiven. But Shirk al-Asr, Shaykh al does not say that he will, he will be in the hellfire forever. Remember. But he will not be, that means he will be punished for it. Where the major sins, they are under the will of Allah, they will what? May be forgiven. But not the Shirk al-Asr. Because in Allah, Allah does not forgive the Shirk. Do you understand that? So the Shirk will not be forgiven. If you die upon it, whether it's Akbar or Asr, according to Shaykh al but the correct opinion is the Akbar only here. Is that it will not be forgiven, the Asr will be forgiven. Right. So, after understanding all of that, you understand all of this hadith that talks about people in the hellfire forever. Otherwise, as I said, it would confuse you. So, here it says forever. Yes, correct, proper translation. But the principle, what Allah had promised, He promised you Jannah, He promised you forgiveness, He will give you. How much? But if He threatened you, if you do this, I'm going to do that to you. If you do this, I'm he might fulfill it, he might not fulfill it. Because he said, I'm not going to fulfill it. I might, from the first instance. That man who had burned himself, he asked his children, and if I die, okay, burn me. Take my ashes. Put half of them in the land and half of them in the sea. Why? He wanted to make it difficult to Allah to gather him. So, so look at that. He wants to make it difficult to Allah to put him back. Is that kufr or not kufr? It's major kufr. It's not, there is no kufr like this. You are doubting the capability of Allah. So take my thing and burn me. Burn me and turn them. Half in the land and half in the sea. Because if you put them in the land, they might gather me back. But put them like this, it will be difficult for him. That's what he means. That's what he means. So the, the sons were very faithful to their father. And they fulfilled his... Because he, he said, Bar Allah, if he capable of getting me back, he will punish me, a punishment that he hasn't punished anybody else. Allah Akbar. Then, Allah Azza wa Jal, on the day of resurrection, which the Prophet is telling us what's going to happen, that he covers him. And then he will say to him, say to those particles, be so, and they will be the this person. Why did you do that? And he knows Allah. It's a rhetorical question. Why did you do that? My slave, Abdi. He said, Khashetukal. Your fear. The fear. This fear resulted into the person being blind. It reminded me of the envy as well. You know the envy? You become blind. You don't know what to do. You become blind. Your heart is blind, your eyes are blind. That's what happens. You begin to be The same person is Jahl. Jahl. And his fear, Jahl with fear, combination which is lethal. Fear with ignorance. You end up going to magicians, you end up going to the sorcerers, lethal. So this person, his fear, he was so scared. He believes in Allah, but his, his fear made him to do that, which is ignorance. Of course it's kufr. They say that you are Allah is not capable of bringing you back, but he didn't know what he's doing because of the fear. You don't believe fear, fear, you don't know what you're doing. And that's why Allah forgave him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sabaqat rahmatuhu ghababah. His mercy had preceded his anger. Khalas. His mercy first and his anger after. Alhamdulillah. Because if his anger first, I don't think anybody who is saying there's a mother, there's a son to Allah, they will be surviving. Okay? They will not be surviving. But his mercy is there. And his patience is there. Now. Follow. How can we protect ourselves from the type 1 envy? Type? Level 1 envy. Level 1 envy? You mean the, uh, the one which is the jealousy? The jealousy. To protect yourself from competing in the dunya is to know that this dunya is not going to last. At the end of the day, that what I'm trying to build for myself is to build for myself a pulse in the hereafter. So, the more you are into the religion, the more that you recite Quran, is one of the keys of reciting the Quran. The more that you do the Qiyam, the more that you come to any of those people who remind you of the Akhirah, this is the less you're going to think about the dunya. And remember that you need to have satisfaction. Qana. Because if you don't have qana'ah satisfaction, money after money and after money, 
You know, people in this country, all other countries as well, they're like zombies. You know zombies? In the morning, train, uh, they don't even talk to each other. Have you seen them? Like dead people coming on the graves. Mm. They don't say salam to each other. Have you seen them? No salam, nothing. Zombies, the land, the land of the dead, walking dead. And they come down dead. It's dead! Because what they want to do, they want to come, you know, they want to you know, get as much as much money and so they could bring up their children, so they could go into the same education and get the same good job and the same, get the money. What a boring life! Do you understand? So, get into the religion, that's the best satisfaction. Those people, you know, they've got BMWs, they've got cars, they've got everything, but they kill themselves. Why? Why do they kill themselves? I mean, we kill ourselves to get a BMW, but they, these people, they've got a BMW, but they kill themselves. <laughs> do you understand? I mean, we kill ourselves, we try hard, but we can't get it. Uh, but they, these people got it, but they kill it. Why? You need to ask yourself why. Because they're happy about the happiness there. The happiness is the relaxation here. They're not relaxed. And I'm just saying the Kufar as well. Even the believers who are corrupt. Yeah, believers, the Muslims, corrupt. Drug addicts and all of that, a'udhu billah. They kill themselves. They're misery, miserable. Once they have the religion, they are on top of the world. Once they come to the Fajr prayer, mashallah. Just come to the Fajr prayer, Jama. You feel your whole day, ah, relaxed. You're on top of the world, alhamdulillah. Now. Khalas. As you said, Sheikh, I have a brother. Uh, let's say he do all evil things, fornicating, drinking, and oh, uh, cut him off. I, I, I don't think it's good if your brother was listening here and you're talking about him in this way. It's true, or not? It's true. And everybody's listening, and your brother is not good. <laughs> so, what we ask the question is here I know a person who's got a brother, so and so and so. To say like this, if I'm your brother, I might fight with you now. Maybe I don't have a brother, but okay, yeah. so we say X man's got a brother and he does all bad things. Yeah, I'm gonna go in details for any case and that. And I mean, your brother, do you fornicate, bro? <laughs> Imagine who told you? Well, it's a man, he just asks a question in front of everybody. <laughs> you got in trouble. <laughs> okay, so this person, yes, does bad evil things. Yes, yeah, um, let's say, stay with me. And I want to cut him off, yeah? And if I cut him off, he's going to go deep away. And he's still How much away. deeper than the, what you have just mentioned? Maybe it's worse than what he Well, what is worse for you? Maybe stealing or... So stealing is worse than fornicating? No. Well, uh... What is worse for you? Stealing or fornicating or drinking? All is, all is evil to me. All is evil. But what is the worst? So it's okay if he drinks? I think uh, <laughs> fornicating is more evil because... No. Yeah. Alcohol is worse. Because alcohol does everything. Once you drink, you fornicate and you steal. And you kill as well. Okay. Remember the story? Yes. <laughs> you kill and you steal and you steal as well, fornicate and you as well do everything. So, Umul Khabad, the mother of all filth, is the alcohol, the wine. So I would say to the believers, if you think it's going to go deeper and worse, more crime, you're going to add more crimes. But what are you doing to him while he's with you? Well, keep on talking and then start talking. Yeah, you're not going to end up like him while he's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, because if I nurse are affected, if I bring you a woman, then you'll be affected. No, no, no. It's like uh, only time I talk to him. Like, but don't allow him to bring the alcohol to the house. No. No allowed to have women, not anything to sit allowed to have in the house. Because you, you don't know what's going to happen to you as well. So I would uh, urge you, inshallah, to um, keep company of uh, drink him, you know, to the house. Not to let him, to leave. what is he, is he working? Mm, he works with himself. He works with himself, you understand me? He's damaging himself. Yeah. Allah, you know, this is, uh, I would say, uh, it's not just simple to say to you what to do. Make dua to Allah, the first weapon, dua to Allah Azza wa that Allah would fix him up. If you've got friends, which are the ones that are bad, taking him away, yeah. he has, this is the problem, you see, his friends pulls him away. And he listens to his friend more than he listens to you. Does he got, you know, his mother, she alive? Father? No. May Allah make it easy, inshallah. Yeah, make dua, inshallah. Mm -hmm.
and keep it, keep, keep, keep it together, the brotherhood, and keep it together. Like you said, I don't want it to go further. It's like Allah for doing that. You're the elder brother? Yes. Now. So the, in, in cutting off or not talking for more than um, three nights, uh, if a person have, uh, has, has tried to communicate and the other person doesn't reply, like I mentioned in the hadith, I mean, it, 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 is it not recommended that he tries to continue? Uh, and uh, if there is a possibility of more rift and the person is going to get even more angry, what, what to do in this type of situation? You mean the salam will provoke him more? No, he's trying to communicate, he's not even picking up the phone. Doesn't he's matter, he, tr phone. he tries. He's not into the major. When he, once he tried and the other person did not reply, he's not outside the major. Now he's concerned about his brother to be, because you don't, you don't gain the love, uh, the belief until you love for your brother what you love for yourself from the good. Mm. True or not? That's the hadith you added as well. You can't gain belief until you love your brother what you love for yourself. So I love myself to be in paradise. So I have to be loved to my brother to be in paradise. So I try my best to bring him out. And then if he's insisted to be in the hellfire, it's up to him. If he insisted to do the major sin, Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he was grieving regarding those people who was not his wanted his call from his family. Don't be grieved. Don't be grieved. Don't, don't, don't you sort of uh, punish yourself because of that. Start Don't guilty. punish yourself now. And this is as well, especially to your own children. You know, you're a child, you're trying your best, and this child is just going away. Like Nuh a.s. child. Son, Nuh a.s. never gave up. And then he asked his Lord, and that's a mistake. Because he had chosen the kufr. But he said, I want to make dua. He said to him, No, he's not Amanu Laybu Saleh. Your supplication to me, O oh, Nuh no, is not good. Because this person has a, I said that he's what? He's a calf. That is a calf. So he's trying to tell him to bring him. And he wants, after his kufr, he wants to say, Yes, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had been a promise by Allah Azza wa regarding his father. Yes, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has been given partial intercession regarding his uncle Abu Talib, but nobody else. Okay, so done. Don't give yourself khalas. He chose this. I'm trying my best. After that, yes, I'm sad because it's my problem. But I can't be punishing myself. I should have done more. I should have done more. You've done your best. Okay? Because in Arabic, latij the dhahr. Don't lash your back because of that. Subhanakallah, bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta